And now I'll introduce our speaker. Ido Levy is an associate fellow working with the Washington Institute for Near East Policies Military and Security Studies program. He holds a Master of Public Policy from Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. Ido, you can go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, it was just a few years ago that I was an intern at START and I'm so honored to be back here to uh, present my, uh, my research. So I will quickly share my screen here. Uh, one second. I think this is it. All right, so um, so th thanks so much for the intro. Uh, th this is uh, this is my book, Soldiers of End Times: Assessing the Military Effectiveness of the Islamic State. Uh, this is the product of basically a year of very intensive research, uh, interviews, uh, um, a lot of uh, research on uh, different sources, and and uh, and I put this all together into a book looking at kind of the conventional. Uh, warfare capabilities of the Islamic State, how was it able to stand up against uh, other conventional armies, be successful, and uh, take some take territory and defend it in some cases. Uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, uh, attention has been given to the terrorism side of things, the insurgency side, which are also very important, and my, my book kind of focuses more on the conventional warfare aspect of it. Um, and I'll just get into it real quick. Right now, you see on the cover of my book, uh, you know, lightly armed infantry with a cameraman. Uh, this is a very uh, kind of a uh, exemplary way of how of how ISIS uh, fights. So, what kind of motivated me to to go into this was uh, that there is a trend now among uh, particularly Sunni jihadist groups. And when I say Sunni jihadists, I'm just uh, I'm differentiating. Uh, groups that are uh, like Al Qaeda, ISIS, um, other groups that claim to uh, follow Sunni Islam, from those who who uh, who are supported by the Iranian regime, which claims to be a, a Shia Islam, uh, those groups would be Hezbollah, um, the Houthis in Yemen, and others like that. Uh, I'm focusing particularly on Sunni jihadist groups, and ISIS is uh, one of the most successful of those. Uh, now, what we've seen over the years is uh, just jihadist groups have always uh, seen, uh, have always uh, aspired to to take over uh, territory and to defend it and to govern it. Their whole goal is to uh, reestablish an Islamic empire, uh, as you can see here on this map, stretching from Spain to Central Asia and going as far as uh, India, the Philippines. Uh, groups have always tried to do this. We've seen we've seen this with the Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, both in the 90s and more recently. We've seen it with uh, Al Qaeda franchises in Africa, uh, in Yemen. Uh, we've seen it, and more most recently, also with with ISIS uh, taking over territory in Iraq and Syria. Uh, however, we we tend to think of these groups as kind of underground, as insurgents, as terrorists who don't uh, who avoid the uh, the battlefield. But when given the opportunity, they always will uh, try to conventionalize, uh, obtain conventional warfare capabilities, and uh, actually. Uh, tried to take and hold territory. And we've seen an acceleration of this, especially after the uh, beginning of the Syrian civil war, where we've seen uh, groups like Jabhat al-Nusra, we've seen uh, ha um, later beca uh, becoming uh, Hayat al-Hariri al-Sham or Ahrar al-Sham also, uh, groups with tens of thousands of members, uh, sometimes joining together under kind of joint commands, uh, using heavy weapons, as you see here, uh, ISIS capturing tanks, um, anti uh, advan more advanced anti-tank weapons, often building their own weapons, such as mortars, uh, and also up, uh, modifying uh, weapons that they've captured from uh, their more uh, advanced adversaries. All, all of these things kind of uh, going into the symbols of conventional warfare, such, such as heavy weapons like tanks and, and anti-tank weapons. Um, so then I, I asked myself, uh, looking at all, all these different jihadist groups and, and how they've uh, per performed over time, what accounts for ISIS's, in particular, its formidable performance on the conventional battlefield? Uh, we've seen ISIS take over a third of Iraq, 
uh, roughly half of Syria, how, how are they able to do this facing, uh, you know, an array of adversaries, uh, the Syrian army, the Iraqi army, uh, other armed groups, how are they able to do this? And so I, I looked at this uh, also using um, uh, not only looking at recent past accounts of this, past uh, people who have written books about this or articles, but also looking at primary source material, uh, often Arabic language material that ISIS itself produced, uh, mag whether magazines or videos, uh, things like that. You can see some excerpts that I took from uh, ISIS uh, videos here. Uh, and um, also I, I relied a lot on interviews with uh, other experts, with uh, particularly with US military officers who have had experience fighting against ISIS and also with, uh, with uh, journalists who were, in, who were in the area of different uh, ISIS battles, things like that. So this is the theory that I, that I came up with. Uh, what, we've, um, we've, what, what motivated ISIS uh, to, to conventionalize? Uh, we have the ideology and organizational development, and then we have four components that, that make up its uh, military effectiveness. So when we're talking about ideology, uh, what I mean by that is uh, the jihadist ideology, first of all, that, uh, that, that wants to re reestablish the Islamic empire, the caliphate, um, and establish governance, defend its territory against its enemies. Uh, but ISIS brought another aspect to this ideology, which is the, uh, an apocalypticism, that, that the end is near, and, and when the end comes, we have to uh, be able to defend the caliphate and use it as a base to fight the Antichrist. Um, that brought a kind of urgency that said, we have to do the, uh, you have to reestablish the empire now, or we won't really have a chance to do it later. So that was one aspect of the ideology. When I talk about organizational development, uh, if you look all the way back to ISIS before it became the Islamic State uh, officially, when it was Al Qaeda in Iraq, uh, when it was uh, the Islamic State of Iraq, and when it developed during the Iraq War, um, it really went from a, a an organization that was uh, very, that had a lot of trouble defending uh, urban territories, which is uh, we saw in 2004, for example. Uh, uh, attempts to defend Fallujah against uh, U.S. forces, or to or to defend other cities uh, later on, um, and they weren't very good at it. But over time, they were able to kind of refine these methods of urban warfare, such as ambush, hit and run, uh, suicide uh, bombing, which which became such a huge thing later on. I'm about to talk about more about more about that. Um, but they were able to refine this during the Iraq War and later use it for uh, to effectively wage conventional warfare against their adversaries. So the first thing that I that I uh, that I looked at and when it comes to how they actually performed on the battlefield was innovation and um, particularly organizational innovation. Now I have this fancy word here, SVBIDs. Uh, re it, it really just means suicide car bombs. And we've seen uh, uh, before the before it became the Islamic State that we saw one or two used at different times uh, as weapons of terror, weapons for insurgency. Um, but what ISIS did was they really upscaled the the um, the production of these of these weapons and used them on the battlefield, kind of in in ways that uh, that modern militaries might use artillery or airstrikes to shock the enemy, to create openings for a breakthrough. And they would use many of them. You wouldn't see one or two anymore. Now you would see 10, sometimes in one, one assault. For example, in the Abu Ghraib assault in 2013, when ISIS um, freed uh, many prisoners from the Abu Ghraib prison, they used something like 10 um, vehicle, uh, suicide car bombs to uh, to support the operation. Another thing is manpower. We've seen a huge swelling in manpower in, in ISIS over uh, in 2013-14, largely driven by uh, an influx of foreign fighters, tens of thousands of foreign fighters into Syria. Um, this, this new manpower allowed it also to upscale its organization, uh, increase uh, also going back to, to explosive and explosive production, and also bring in expertise that they would need to, uh, for example, have specialized capabilities like sniping or like bomb making or other things like that. Now, the second important thing I have here is shaping operations. Uh, when 
ISIS, uh, even with all its its uh, and its heavy and and even when it did have heavy weapons like tanks uh, or artillery, those became very um, uh, vulnerable once the U.S. and the coalition got involved with airstrikes and uh, and other things like that. And they had that's why that's part of the reason why they had to rely so much on suicide car bombs is because those were those were easy to get around airstrikes. You could have them in civilian vehicles. Um, you could launch them and quickly hit the target, and uh, and then you wouldn't have to worry about retreating and things like that. Um, and uh, so so uh, a lot of the times their heavy weapons became uh, vulnerable, and the kind of the whole ISIS way of war developed around using suicide car bombs or lighter uh, lighter weapons. Uh, and one of the things that allowed them to defeat enemies that had access to heavy, he heavier weapons and to more advanced weapons was, was shaping operations such, such as engaging tribes in, uh, in Iraq. We see this in particular, um, uh, going to local populations and uh, making sure that uh, trying to co-opt those local populations, co-opting local uh, elders of tribes or co-opting community leaders, or uh, just assassinating those that don't cooperate inserting sleeper cells into different um, urban environments. Like in Mosul, we saw this in 2014 uh, when Mosul fell to ISIS. Um, they use these, uh, these methods to kind of, and also infiltrating security forces, such as uh, inserting ISIS fighters into the Iraqi army, which, which happened quite a lot. Then they used all these methods to make their adversaries brittle. So when the, when the attack came, they would fall quickly and um, there, would be, there wouldn't be much of a fight. The third thing is will to fight. This is probably the most, this is the most consistent uh, factor that we see throughout ISIS's operations. Very motivated, determined fighters. Uh, and a lot of this comes from the ideology, which is commitment to their, to their cause of creating the Islamic empire. Um, and we, we do see that a lot. Another one is coercion. ISIS didn't really have a problem with uh, forcing people to fight if it needed to. Uh, you weren't allowed to leave the organization, for example. And this also went on the battlefield. You weren't really allowed to retreat unless there was a there was a uh, plan to retreat. You weren't allowed to retreat, and we barely ever saw any any uh, mass surrenders. Towards the end, we did, but even then, you know, we can debate whether that was because of um, that was just out of demoralization or fear, or there was even there was even towards the end a plan that we're going to surrender so that in the future we can. Uh, uh, hone, our, hone our power and different refugee camps and prisons in the future will come back. Uh, and the last thing is stimulation. We hear about it a lot about it now with uh, drugs, for example. Uh, ISIS used uh, the captagon a lot. Um, these pill, uh, amphetamine pills that uh, would could make uh, a human being function for well well beyond natural capabilities. Uh, you know, for hours and hours on end, not have to sleep. Um, enhanced uh, kind of sensory uh, sensory feelings, and um, this would allow them to uh, also uh, perform on the battlefield when fear might might be an issue. Uh, the last thing is initiative. Once you have all these things down, keeping the initiative was very important for ISIS because if they got bogged down into a long fight, usually what would happen is air power would would start uh, making uh, would start giving them more problems. We would start seeing uh, let uh, them rely more on their individual combat skills, which weren't as proficient as, say, their will to fight or their use of car bombs and things like that. Um, and also, it would allow them to hit them where the where the enemy is most brittle. So, all these shaping operations wouldn't really work unless ISIS was able to actually hit the target that it wanted to hit later on. And that that's uh, very that goes into keeping the initiative. Um, you take all these things together. And that's how, uh, that's how we, are, we arrive at ISIS's military effectiveness. And in my book, I apply this to four case studies of uh, different battles that ISIS were involved, two, two offensive battles where ISIS attacked uh, an adversary and two defensive battles. And uh, these, these four uh, variables help explain how it performed in those different battles. So, and here, uh, because I'm, I'm at start, I wanted to show, I did use uh, some data from the GTD for this book. Uh, this is a, just a simple graph of the um, increase in suicide bombing over, over the decade between 2003 and 2013. Um, as you can see, it, it went up significantly. 
uh, you know, from a low of uh, 89 in 2003 to a, to a high of 622 in 2013. And this was largely driven by, a, uh, by, by uh, the, the war in Iraq, what um, different insurgents were doing there, including ISIS, uh, which kind of honed these, these uh, suicide attack skills uh, to later use them in conventional warfare. So what does this all mean about the, uh, the ISIS way of war? Um, it's, the ISIS way of war is about, um, it's about uh, really focusing on the, the will to fight, will to fight of, of ISIS fighters versus the will to fight of the enemy, which creates this uh, maximal uh, morale differential that allows for easy victories and, uh, and, and the things that I was just talking about before. So, you have really determined uh, fighters against uh, demoralized enemies. A lot of the times they would be demoralized through shaping operations. And all that would be needed is a quick assault to, to take them down. That would be, that's the kind of the goal of the ISIS way of war. Now it's an innovative model of conventional warfare because uh, it doesn't really, uh, not innovative in the sense that it creates new technologies, although ISIS did, uh, was innovative in that sense as well. We can see down in the, in the bottom right, ISIS fighters using drones uh, that, that uh, on a large scale that we actually haven't seen before, whether in terrorist organizations or not. And today drones are becoming such a big phenomenon. And, and ISIS was, one, was, was really the, the first organization to use small drones on, on a large scale and, and like swarming or, in, or, in, or as uh, kamikaze weapons. Um, and, uh, and so, but, but really what we see is more like what we see on the bottom left. The bulldozer that they just up armored heavily with, with uh, scales, with metal plates, with grills, with things like that, that would make it uh, sometimes impervious to uh, a couple RPG rounds. Um, and it would be so hard to take down uh, and then add to that. And then it's a suicide bomb that would, that when it hits it, it, it makes such a huge explosion that it can take down enemy armor. Um, these kinds of things were, uh, you know, just modified civilian vehicles that, that uh, could be used as weapons of war on the, on the battlefield. And, and that was a big part of it, more so than, than, for example, use of tanks, which sometimes they even use tanks as, as suicide bombs. They would put uh, explosives on their tanks and, and use them as heavily armored uh, suicide bombs to um, destroy enemy positions. Uh, and that's what, uh, that's what I mean by this enhancements and upscaling. What you see is uh, they would uh, take, you know, any civilian vehicle and just enhance it, put armor on it, um, use it for, uh, for, for conventional warfare purposes. Uh, and you would also see this in the, their logistical operations as well. You would see, uh, for example, regular just civilian motorcycles, civilian pickup trucks that they would use to avoid um, airstrikes. Um, that they would use to, uh, to transport lots of materiel. And, and a lot of the time, because they were using civilian vehicles uh, and they wouldn't necessarily put um, obvious uh, military equipment on it, uh, it could also disrupt uh, you know, uh, surveillance. It could disrupt uh, airstrikes because uh, we, uh, we as a uh, military power, we need to follow the laws, laws of armed conflict. And we don't uh, attack uh, civilian civilian vehicles unless we're un unless we're sure that they're being used for for military purposes. And ISIS exploited this all the time. We also see this with uh, use of human shields, especially in urban environments like Mosul. They would uh, take together different civilians, put them together, take their families to the battlefield, uh, and this would be very uh, make it very difficult uh, to fight them many times. And the last thing I want to talk about here is the relationship with ISIS provinces. So ISIS, we know it's not only a phenomenon for Iraq and Syria, it also had uh, franchises all over, or we would call, actually would more accurate to call them provinces, because that's what they called themselves. Um, provinces of the, the ISIS empire all over the world, uh, from the Philippines to, um, also to Nigeria, to uh, more recently we've seen in Mozambique and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And what ISIS did is it would uh, share its conventional warfare capabilities with these other provinces. Um, and what we've seen is anytime a, a group uh, in, in these areas pledged allegiance to ISIS, gave an oath of allegiance, um, we would see very uh, soon after that, 
attempts to do larger scale attacks. We would see attempts to hold territory, to take over different territories, whether it's in the Sinai, whether it's in Nigeria, Afghanistan, anywhere where we've seen groups uh, that, that uh, claim allegiance to ISIS, we saw very quick uh, kind of uh, attempts at, at conventionalization and becoming proficient in conventional warfare. Um, and uh, we've seen some have been more successful than others. For example, in Libya, uh, they had quite a successful enterprise for, for, for some time because ISIS sent uh, lots of its foreign fighters there. Uh, my colleague at the Institute, for example, Aaron Zeleny, has very good work on this, on um, how ISIS uh, took foreign fighters that went to Syria and kind of redirected them to, to Libya to support uh, the franchise there so that they would have experienced uh, personnel there. They would have people who know how to um, fight in conventional battles. Um, and that helped them a lot uh, take over, uh, particularly these two cities, Derna and, and Sirte, which they defended um, pretty, uh, and Sirte particularly, they defended very fiercely. And you can also read more about that in my book. And the way that they defended it and took it was almost identical to the way that they operated in Iraq and Syria. Um, and so what we see, uh, we see that those provinces like Libya that got more support from ISIS were able to develop better proficiency in, uh, in conventional warfare. Uh, we see different um, levels of proficiency in Nigeria and the Philippines and other places. And, and we can go more into that if people are interested. So what does this mean for, for policy? Well. For, for policy, we know that jihadist warfare is, is here to stay. It's in their ideology. It, there's, a, there's an imperative to take territory and defend it. Uh, they're gonna, anytime they get an opportunity, they're going to do it, whether it's ISIS or, or any other group uh, that, that's a jihadist group. Um, we see continuing campaigns in Africa and Afghanistan. We see uh, continuing ISIS activity also in Syria and Iraq. Um, and we saw, for example, the recent prison break in Hasaka uh, in, in Syria that they tried to break out um, a lot of their uh, members from that prison. Um, these are all uh, activities in service of being able to one day come back and take over the territory that they, they used to control and to defeat their adversaries on conventional battlefields because they know that that's what they're going to have to do to reach that goal. The other thing is uh, U.S. partner forces. In Iraq, we have to continue enabling this force, the counterterrorism services you see here, which was a spearhead in defeating ISIS in Iraq, uh, supported by, with support from the Iraqi army, which was very important. And our support for them with, when were, with airstrikes, with logistics, um, with advisory uh, capacities, things like that, have been crucial in defeating ISIS's territory and uh, rolling it back. And so we have to continue uh, giving that support if, we're, if we want to continue to make sure that ISIS will not uh, come back um, and be as big of a threat it was before. In Syria, we have the Syrian Democratic Forces that we partnered with. Um, also very, uh, very strong force that, uh, that benefited a lot from our support and being, and, and being able to uh, defeat the Islamic State in Syria. Uh, and it's crucial to, to emphasize that these, these, these two uh, forces, they wouldn't really be able to achieve what they did without our support. And that's why it's so important for us to, to continue having these long-term relationships. Uh, we have to keep uh, that long-term relationship because it also uh, will, in the long run, it will foster uh, more of their own capabilities and innovation and determination. Well, one of the biggest problems that we saw with the Iraqi army early on in the war against ISIS was that so many of their divisions collapsed uh, almost without a fight. Um, and this is uh, that kind of um, huge loss in morale that was partially a, a result of, uh, of ISIS uh, shaping operations, but it was also a result of, of us not, uh, not kind of sticking with them and, uh, and leaving them early on in 2011, for example, uh, as well as their own missteps. Uh, but, but that long-term um, sticking with your, your allies is what fosters that determination and that capacity for innovation that, that will hopefully match ISIS. Because right now, uh, jihadi groups have shown a, a great capacity for innovation that, that we have yet to match, at least our partners have yet, yet to match in terms of tactics and, and things like that. Um, last thing is, is technology. 
uh, we we should be integrating uh, new technology, new technological uh, advancements with with our partner forces. Uh, for example, loitering munitions or cyber warfare. Those things can be uh, totally applicable. I think the counterterrorism missions, and also as we talk, especially today with the invasion of Ukraine and and all this uh, stuff that's going on with with Russia. Um, these these are technologies that we can learn how to use with our partner forces and also have applicability to great to issues of great power competition. Um, and because we are actively supporting our partners now, we can we can we have an opportunity to integrate those technologies now and learn how to use them now so that we can have this advantage uh, in, in the great power realm. Um, the other thing is air power. Air, air power has been essential for supporting our our um, partners, and we will have to keep that up somehow. Uh, if we, you know, I, I think that the best thing is for us to stick with them uh, for the long term. But uh, as we've seen, there's kind of been a trend towards uh, withdrawal, and if that that's the path that we take, then what we'll have to do is uh, make sure that we, they can have some kind of substitute for that. And one thing that we can do is. Uh, like provide a fleet of uh, smaller drones, things that, that can partially make up for, for what we provide to them. Um, so now, because uh, I'm, I'm at start, and uh, because this is, uh, uh, this, is, this is a paper that I wrote, well, in parallel to my research for the book, um, and I wanted to just present it here real quick because I think it's, it's uh, pretty relevant. Um, this was uh, this paper that I wrote called Lethal Believes Ideology and Lethality of Terrorist Organizations uh, is actually an idea that I came up with during my internship at START, where I, where I wanted to look at how, how does ideology of terrorist organizations correlate with the lethality of terrorist organizations. And how I, how I did this was by uh, coding uh, groups, basically uh, because I'm interested in the jihadi ideology looking at uh, whether they are jihadi or not, are jihadis really more lethal, what accounts for their lethality, uh, and I use the GTD to, for, for, for the data for this study. Um, now, what, what I, my theory was that this, uh, one, one of the things that uh, made, their, made uh, jihadis more lethal was their goals, uh, because as I said, they want to take over an empire, they want to expand this empire, they want to actually defeat um, enemies like uh, on, on the battlefield, and uh, that that would uh, require more lethal weapons, probably more more lethal activities. Um, the other thing is uh, cohesion that they have an internal cohesion, um, and that they uh, are kind of cohesive with with other uh, like minded groups, um, and that this uh, this cohesion and better organization will make them more better positioned to to take to carry out. Um, more deadly attacks. And the last thing is affinity, which uh, that has to do with uh, sponsorship from, from the states um, that, that have uh, states or, or other um, significant entities that have uh, kind of uh, ideological affinity with the group. Um, and the, the thing that I really want to emphasize again here is that for ISIS, there, for jihadis in general, there is this imperative to one, one day there will have to be a, a stage of conventional warfare. And uh, that's that is something that I think um, that I didn't really uh, capture in, the, in this study as much. But after writing this book, um, kind of coming and to this conclusion of, hey, well, yeah, jihadis are are more lethal, and uh, I'll get more a little bit more into what that means. But the the conventional uh, part of the reason why they're more lethal is because they really seek to to do this uh, conventional warfare, uh, which is which is more lethal in general, it's more lethal than terrorism or insurgency, uh, you know, compare any, any uh, large war between uh, conventional war to, to any terrorist campaign. I mean, you'll see like the, the casualties uh, are not, uh, they're not on the same scale. Um, and so I think that conventionalization or convention or the, the, the desire to, take, to, to carry out conventional warfare is such an important thing that that might be uh, missed and then kind of in the in the data um, and that that kind of helps explain why ISIS is an outlier in terms of terrorist organizations in terms of its lethality when uh, over just the course of a few years it became I think the most lethal uh, terrorist organization uh, even though it was only a few years old um, 
and, and remained so for, for quite a while. Uh, and that helps explain why it's an outlier. So quickly, I'll just explain like some, uh, some results that I had to this study. Um, we see that uh, the, the, being a jihadist group uh, did, in, did increase, basically what, it, what this means is that being a jihadist group did uh, seem, it does seem to increase lethality. Uh, use of suicide bombing also does. Uh, and those, those are in particular uh, the, the most uh, important variables that I found. Uh, sponsorship we can talk about as well. Uh, it, it also has a significant correlation, but I, I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure how, um, uh, how much of an important effect that, that was just because, you know, we can talk about that if you want. But um, so why, these, what this tells me now after, after writing my book and doing all this research is uh, yeah, jihadis, uh, the suicide bombing, as I talked about, was a big aspect of ISIS conventional warfare. Um, well, this, this kind of, it all seems to come together and say, hey, well, conventional, conventionalization all can all, probably is one of those things that leads to greater lethality among terrorist groups. Um, so I think that's about, that's about it for my presentation. Uh, I kept it pretty short and I, I am uh, happy to take questions. I love taking questions about this. Uh, yeah. Peter, thank you so much. Um, for all of our attendees, you are welcome to drop any questions that you have in the Q&A and I'll go ahead and moderate those. Um, I know that that kind of takes a second for people to kind of frantically type questions so I can go ahead and ask a couple of my own. Um, while I'm waiting for other folks to drop some questions uh, in the QA, Q and A, as I mentioned, um, uh, Ido, one thing I noticed you, I actually noticed you tweeted about something, um, and so I wanted to ask you to kind of expound on it. But you mentioned that uh, this talk holds lessons on the role of air power and how to fight in urban environments, which right. is relevant to, uh, of course, the the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. I was wondering if you could kind of expand on that. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um... So what we what we see with with ISIS for I, I think if you can you look particularly at the Battle of Mosul as, as a case study for this, it was a it was a battle where uh, we uh, where us the coalition with the Iraqi army um, we attacked a urban environment where ISIS was dug in for two years they they developed defenses there uh, anything from sniping positions to ambush teams to uh, to just barricades on the road or or things like that that would funnel our movement, that made it hard for us to, to target them. Uh, and, and the added thing, this is kind of like the big difference, because we were so concerned about civilian casualties, we also, uh, we had to work extra hard to identify where they were in certain buildings, or if they were uh, in tunnels, or if they were uh, running in, in concealed positions, and we couldn't tell whether they were civilians. Um, that kind of changed it. Of course, Russia doesn't really follow those rules. So uh, that, that's kind of a big difference. But um, what we see is that the Iraqi army had a lot of trouble advancing if we didn't provide them with, and I mean heavy air support. The Battle of Mosul saw more than a thousand airstrikes uh, in, throughout the, the nine months of the battle. And uh, sometimes they would not even move. I remember one general uh, describing it as like uh, McClellan-esque, like McClellan, the, the Civil War general who was known for not advancing, even though he, he had more, he had way more numbers than the enemy, um, that they wouldn't move unless we really gave them heavy artillery and air support. Um, and, and to some extent, uh, that, that kind of makes sense because ISIS was so dug into the urban environment, it, it kind of becomes like a hell on earth to fight. Uh, when you're in, in that situation where every, every step that you go, you could be attacked in an ambush or a sniper or a suicide car bomb could come out of nowhere and just uh, tear you apart. And this is, some, this is not necessarily uh, something that's unique to ISIS. We've seen throughout history, urban warfare is the harder uh, type of warfare because it's so hard to fight in a city. Uh, and, and we're seeing that play out now in Ukraine that we see the Russians, uh, they have their own issues, but they're, they're having trouble as an attack, heavily armed attacking force breaking into um, urban, urban uh, environments like Kiev or, or uh, like uh, the other cities that they're trying to take over. Um, 
and what this kind of teaches us is that uh, that that the urban warfare is, as a lot of people are saying now, kind of this great equalizer. That it doesn't necessarily matter if you have all this advanced weaponry, this heaven, heavy weaponry. The second you get into a uh, urban environment, uh, you could you could be really bogged down by a lightly armed defending force. And the thing that the Ukrainians kind of have going for them now is that they're not that lightly armed, right? We're providing them with uh, anti-aircraft weapons, anti-tank weapons that hopefully will 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 take them that step further. They'll be able to kind of one up ISIS because ISIS didn't really have these uh, anti-air capabilities. Maybe the Ukrainians will be able to provide do some kind of um, uh, disruption of, of uh, Russian air superiority, uh, maybe even uh, use some of their own air assets for offensive uh, maneuvers like we've seen with, uh, for example, the Turkish drones that the Ukrainians have, have acquired. Uh, those have been used for, for some kind of offensive air, air attack capability. Um, and when you combine this urban warfare hell with the possibility to dispute the air and to possibly take, take the fight a little bit outside the city, uh, those things can make it really hard for an attacker to get in. And I'm trying, What for me, it's like, you can look at the Ukraine battlefield and see how that affects them. But then if you look at ISIS, for example, ISIS defended Mosul for nine months without much of an uh, advanced anti-air uh, capability and uh, with limited um, weaponry and things like that. Um, imagine if they had uh, some kind of way to dispute our, uh, our air superiority, it would be, it could it could have stopped our attack completely. There were times in the Mosul offensive where we thought we wouldn't be able to to complete the uh, the offensive, and um, so that that kind of that, that that's what got me thinking about uh, in this Ukraine situation where they are kind of in a better position to um, to uh, be able to stop the the offensive. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we do have a couple of questions in the Q and A. Again, everyone, you're welcome to kind of jump in as much as you like. Um, but our first question is, uh, what is the difference between ISIS and other jihadist ideologies on the one hand and be between those and other ideologies on the other? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the second part of that. So uh, the question is, what's the difference between ISIS and other types of jihadist ideologies on the one hand, and then mm -hmm. those and other ideologies on the other? I'm not quite sure what this question is asking so maybe okay. you could just if you could just talk to us about like yeah. um isis and then in the broad spectrum of violent jihadism like the other types of groups and things like that right so for sure yeah the the kind of the history of jihadi ideology can go it goes back decades uh but at first it was very locally focused um for example if you look at the taliban or if you look at uh hamas for example even uh, you can see that these groups were very focused on particular areas of the world, whether it's Afghanistan, overthrowing the corrupt regime in Afghanistan, or for Hamas, it's uh, destroying Israel and replacing it with uh, an Islamic state. Um, but they didn't really look to, they, they weren't really imperialistic, quote unquote, they didn't seek to kind of create, recreate the caliphate and expand out of that, even though they did see that as a desirable goal. It's not something that they necessarily aspired to. Over time, you saw kind of the internationalization of uh, jihad that, that happened during the, uh, the anti-Soviet jihad in Afghanistan, um, where that's where you saw Abdullah Azam, uh, he was really the big uh, ideologue behind this, uh, saying that Muslims all over the world have an obligation to come and fight in Afghanistan and throughout the Soviets. Um, and that's where you saw the first foreign fighter movement of jihadis, um, and that, but it was still kind of locally focused on Afghanistan. Um, and, and later, uh, Osama bin Laden, who worked with Azam and who worked with uh, Afghan Jihad, uh, he later made it, uh, made it into a thing of, well, no, we actually, what we should be fighting for is the recreation of the caliphate. Uh, and this is where people, I think, uh, think, oh, okay, well, now they're just terrorists because Osama, Osama bin Laden, uh, obviously he did the 9-11 the attacks, but he didn't really, Al-Qaeda never, Al-Qaeda as, as the uh, central group of Al-Qaeda never actually tried to hold territory like the Taliban did or like Al-Qaeda franchises did later. And the reason for that is because they saw what happened in Afghanistan. They saw that the Taliban took power and was later 
in 2001, kicked out by, by uh, the, the military might of the US military. Um, and so he, he, was, uh, he was very affected by this and said, no, we, we shouldn't uh, openly hold territory until we have solid support from the population, until we have like really developed military capabilities. Uh, the problem is uh, a lot, um, most of the major Al Qaeda franchises that came after that, whether it's Al Qaeda in Iraq, which later became ISIS, Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb in, um, in West Africa and North, and North Africa as well, uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Yemen, all of them at one point or another, or Al Shabaab in, in Somalia, which later also pledged allegiance to Al Qaeda. Um, all of them at one point or another said, now is the time, we don't have time to wait, we're going to take territory because that's what jihad is about. And that, that's really what they, they always uh, saw it as. But still, they were kind of focused um, on these local areas, uh, even though they, they were all, but at least at that point, there was kind of this goal of one day we'll, we will uh, take all these territories together and become an empire. ISIS took it even further and said, you're all apostates, you're all infidels. Uh, like if you support Al Qaeda, you're just delaying, uh, you're, you're, you're not even, you're not a real Muslim because you're delaying the, the uh, takeover of, uh, of the empire. We can do it now, let's do it now. Uh, and let's keep fighting forever. We're not gonna get involved with all this negotiation with the, the enemy and things like that. Um, and that's kind of where, where ISIS came from. And the ISIS, of course, like I mentioned, they also had this apocalyptic strain, which Al Qaeda frowned upon. They, they were very, they kind of thought it was like a low class thing, like to think about the apocalypse. But for ISIS, uh, there was this feeling that the, the end is near and we won't have, uh, you know, like this delaying. It's not, it's not only sinful to delay the return of the empire, but it's also uh, it's also um, going to put us in a really bad position when the apocalypse comes. We have to be ready to fight the the antichrist. That's really what they they're they're thinking, um, and so that's where ISIS kind of went out on a limb and became like the most extreme of the the jihadi groups, um, and it was still uh, quite popular among uh, jihadis and supporters of, of jihad. Uh, and why I mentioned also earlier the the Shia. Um, jihadist uh, strain. That's kind of a separate thing. I don't really focus on that. But that is what you see uh, Iranian sponsored terrorism around the world, whether it's Hezbollah, uh, the, the Houthis in, in Yemen, things like that. That's a whole different ideology that's all based around uh, replicating the Islamic Republic model of Iran. Um, and that's something I'm not, uh, I'm not a huge expert in that. Uh, but is it also very interesting? And they also have their own kind of uh, style of conventional warfare that I've seen. If you see, for example, in Yemen, the Houthis have developed uh, like a very, uh, very proficient war machine, uh, like on kind of uh, compar comparable to ISIS. Uh, and so that's a whole other discussion that we can get into. Um, and I'm not sure if, uh, yeah, like I'm not, I'm not an expert on uh, different, uh, different terrorist ideologies, but we can go like into what's are, are nationalists more lethal than, than jihadis or religious motivation? Is there something about a religious motivation that's uh, uh, more important than, um, than a non-religious one? We've seen also communist terrorists and, and so on. So, but, you know, I mean, if, if someone's interested, I can talk about that more. Um, I think so, because the follow-up to this question is, uh, what about the ideology of ISIS makes it more efficient as, at encouraging participation in extremist tactics compared to that of other jihadists? Um, I would say it's the, that piece of urgency where that they say we can't delay, we have to do this now. Uh, and that you're, you're an apostate if you don't do it now. Not, not only you're like, uh, it's like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you later. No, you're an apostate and, and you're gonna be our target if you don't, if you don't join us. It's like a join us or, or die kind of thing, uh, which, which causes extremism. But I think also ISIS has created this uh, image of themselves as perpetual fighters. They're always uh, gonna be fighting. They're not gonna be like the Taliban and, and one day turn around and say, you know what, let's negotiate with uh, the Americans so that they'll, they'll uh, withdraw. No, ISIS is always gonna fight the, the infidel and fight the, uh, the apostates. And that's something that I think was very, also very attractive. And also this, this uh, kind of this refusal to negotiate also kind of comes from their, their ideology of, 
um, of when when the end times are here, uh, it's not it's not really going to matter. You know, it's, uh, the you're, you'll be you're going to be judged for for what you've done, and if if you uh, make peace with uh, with the Antichrist, and that you're not going to be on the right side of history. Um, so it is that kind of uh, that that idea. Whereas um, I think another thing you could look at is the attitude towards uh, Shia Muslims, where you see this even as early as as uh, when ISIS was Al Qaeda in Iraq, there was this this uh, this this view of the Shia that they will uh, they will reappear in the apocalypse as uh, as the servants of the Antichrist, and that they're so bad that they have to be targeted before any other group of people. Um, whereas Al Qaeda said, yeah, yeah, you know, the Shia, they're they're not uh, they're 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 not uh, on the right path. They're they're uh, infidels, but they, you know, that they're ignorant, so we're gonna let it slide for now. Uh, that that was kind of Al Qaeda's uh, <laughs> approach to things, where ISIS said, no, we're gonna fight them until the end times, and that's uh, that's uh, I guess that that that's kind of what differentiates them. Okay, thank you. Um, so our next question is about um, the ISIS's military effecti effectiveness. You mentioned that uh, the role of foreign fighters that they've played. Um, is there any kind of mi military effectiveness of those same foreign fighters when they act on behalf of ISIS in Europe, or can Europe not be considered a battlefield in the strict sense? Um, yeah, I mean, and the, it, it, it depends on what, what you mean by that. But when it comes to terrorist attacks, I mean, yeah, we've seen uh, foreign fighters that go back uh, to their home countries and, and commit terrorist attacks. Now, it's, it's important to get into this. That that's the whole, the whole other aspect of how big of a threat are returning foreign fighters. Uh, that's a whole other topic that we can get into. Um, but Europe, uh, Europe, for example, in itself, or the U.S., they wouldn't be considered uh, kind of conventional battlefields. Those would be considered more like places where you can you can do terrorist attacks, um, but not necessarily where we're going to invest uh, we're going to invest uh, time and effort in creating like territorial uh, strongholds. Um, but we have seen them. Uh, for example, the the attacks in in Paris um, in uh, 2015, I believe um, it was. Uh, you know, we saw we saw uh, ISIS foreign fighters. Um, we saw them go back and and kind of create this network to do that, to do that attack. Um, and the purpose of that attack was to uh, because uh, France and other Western countries, European countries, were involved in this global coalition to defeat ISIS. The purpose of the attack was to say, um, get out of our territory. Uh, and we won't we won't mess with you like uh, as as long as you uh, you know when you come and you, if you come here and keep bombing us we're going to keep doing terrorist attacks against you so I mean in in Europe or in the U S uh, there there wasn't really a, a conventional idea of a military like a conventional military concept it was more to keep them away from the battlefields in in the Middle East or in Africa or in other places. Uh, what, where we did see um, I, ISIS uh, foreign fighters uh, kind of use their either military uh, prowess to increase ISIS capabilities, we saw that in different provinces, for example, in Nigeria or in Libya or in the Sinai, they did see that as a conventional uh, battlefield where it's important to hold territory, partially because those are um, considered uh, core aspects of the uh, Islamic empire that, that ISIS wants to recreate. Sure. Um, and now with our next question, we're pivoting a little bit, um, but this person wanted to ask about America working with partners. Um, you mentioned that one of, one of the reasons for bad morale in Iraq was that the United States left in 2011 or pulled out in 2011. Um, how were we able to regain our partners' trusts? So a big part of that was the Iraqi Counterterrorism Service, the Iraqi Special Forces. Uh, which we we created back in 2003 2004 uh, after we invaded Iraq uh, it was one of the first military units of, of the of the new Iraqi army that we um, established and we kind of we U.S. special forces in particular were the ones who were who were overseeing this project completely and it was that very close interaction between the U.S. special forces and the Iraqi special forces that 
uh, made them, that made them stand out so much. And in 2014, when it came time to fight against ISIS, those Iraqi special forces, even though they weren't trained for conventional warfare, they they adapted, they paid a high price for it, but they adapted and they were the most motivated uh, uh, aspect of, of the Iraqi army. And without them, I could have, you know, it would be hard to imagine, it wouldn't be hard to imagine that ISIS would have taken a lot more territory before we would get there in time and be able to push them back. So when it, when it comes to regaining their trust, all we had to do in that case was uh, send our special forces back. And, and that really gave them a huge morale boost. I remember talking to a general who said, like, you should have seen the Iraqi special forces headquarters when, when our special forces who came back to Iraq, they were, they were elated. They were so happy to, that, that we came back uh, to be with them because really they felt like they were abandoned in, in 2011. Uh, and that was such a huge morale booster that we saw throughout the war. They, they kept that morale up. Now, when you talk about the rest of the army, the conventional army, the um, regular army of, of Iraq, they always kind of had these problems with determination um, because of how they're managed, because of corruption, because of how ISIS infiltrated them and how uh, ISIS was able to shape uh, the battlefield. Um, but uh, and, and that's something that, that we've had much more trouble with, which is uh, uh, training and creating determined regular armies. Uh, that's something we're still working on. It's actually the subject of my next research project. Uh, so hopefully I'll have more later. Well, we'll certainly look forward to that when it comes out. Um, and now I don't see any more questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, of course, if you're if you're frantically typing some, something, you're you're welcome to kind of finish what you're what you're typing. Um, but for now, Ido, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, it was my pleasure, and thank you so much for having me. Of course, um, and thank you for all of uh, our attendees for joining us today. I've added a link to our events page in the chat, so if you liked this event, you're welcome to check out the other events that we have coming up. Um, and that's all we have for you. So thank you for coming and I hope you all have a wonderful day.